in some flows. Includes Eileen Bloomley, who has had enough events where she's probably deprived of the power of speech, I think, at this stage in time. I was going to apologize for the weather, as we are wont to do in Ireland, having brought it with us, but because the sun is shining, I'm absolved of that responsibility. Um, this is a partnership between the Payment Center, between the Royal Irish Academy, the Merchant Tube, anyway, Galway, and we're delighted to be here. So I have just the briefest of duties to say hello and to introduce the Payment here. My I'd like to thank you, Jane. Jane Cook, of the Royal Irish Academy, who's been a very long association with Irish drama, in particular through the biography and database. And um, so we'll kick off with our talk still. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. Um, again, the weather. I mean, in Ireland, we think we know what rain is. But the biblical deluge has died out in Ireland. It's kind of nice, soft rain or steady, constant rain, but not what we saw this morning. And we all woke up. I was woken up by a noise in my room which alerted me to the fact that the house might be on fire. I'd never heard this noise before. It was an alert on my phone from the authorities to let me know there was flash flooding in my area. And this reminds me that somebody always knows where you bloody well are. <laughs> we didn't know that already from Cambridge Analytica and the rest of it. So um, we're here to have a round table discussion on Shaw, our contemporary. Paddy and Mr. Punch, Roy Foster's 1993 book of essays, he quotes George Bernard Shaw on the subject of national self image in 1923. We are now citizens of the world, and the man who divides the race into elect Irishmen and reprobate foreign devils, especially Englishmen, had better live on the baskets where he can admire himself without disturbance. Perhaps, after all, our late troubles were not so purposeless as they seemed. They were probably ordained to prove to us that we are no better than others. And when Ireland was once forced to accept this stupendous new idea, goodbye to the old patriotism. That quote is still opposite almost 100 years later. Uh, and in Ireland, trying to come to terms with the collapse of Catholicism as a social force, the endless struggle to create a workable system of governance in Northern Ireland, cultural diversity, intolerable levels of poverty, even more intolerable levels of wealth, and what appear to be rogue financial institutions that believe themselves with a fair justification to be beyond any kind of sanction able to do exactly what they like. In all of these matters and many more, George Bernard Shaw would be of use to us. Despite his huge reputation and popularity during his very long lifetime, he died in 1950 at the age of 94, he has faded in some respects from public view, except for some half a dozen public space. The Royal Irish Academy has been making a concerted effort to remind everyone what an interesting, intelligent, humane, skeptical, and what a funny character he was, and how he managed to explore different aspects of that character to promote the vast number of ideas he generated and despised. This Shaw Fest has included to date Quentin O'Toole's wonderful judging Shaw, recently extravagantly and appropriately praised by Simon Keller in the New York Review Books, an exhibition at the Museum of Dublin where we got to see the famous Trubetsko statue of Shaw sporting bristling moustaches and eyebrows and physical expression. This statue we saw for many years, those who lived in Dublin, outside the National Gallery which you could never get to see it close up. And it was just lovely to stand right beside him and observe him bristling away uh, just there. Also, a unique intimate promenade performance of a special commission script, Judging Shaw, by the leading Irish site specific theatre company, and New Productions. A new exhibition on the life, work, and legacy of Shaw at the O'Donoghue Theatre at NY Galway, on which the exhibition you can see around the room here in the next room uh, is based and a screening of My Astonishing Self, an OT TV documentary on Shaw's life. Today's event is the latest manifestation of travelling Shaw, a caravan which will move on to other places. <laughs> here. Later this evening, you'll hear Finton on the subject of Shaw and nationalism, a not uncomplicated subject on which he will expand with his usual grace. Those of you who do not already possess his book will be able to buy it and have it signed after this event, or even before it, if you are hanging about in between. Besides being a thoroughly sparkling, fresh, and learned book of Shaw's an extremely beautiful book, with the production values you've come to expect from Ruth Hegarty and for Dermot Slattery of the Royal Irish Academy, so don't lose an opportunity to own it. The topic for our round table today is Shaw, our contemporary exclamation mark or point, as you said here. Is he still relevant today? Are his many ideas out of date? Are his plays worth producing and seeing? Is his fantastically successful project of personal branding a cautionary tale? Or an inspiration to an age obsessed with branding. His own version of the branding mega success of the GPS is that this entity was quite a different person to Bernard Shaw, who, as Shaw said himself, was a pitiably nervous, timid man born with a whole clue 
of flash batteries. Not so GPS, we have one man ground able to get away with all kinds of outrageous and fascinating stuff because it was recognized to be brilliant and also very fun. The last part of my quote, incidentally, is that nowadays that only gives zest to the fun of swanking at every opportunity. They also understood the power and the potential misuse of general adoration. Quote, I've advertised my success so well that I find myself, while still in middle life, almost as legendary a person as the Flying Dutchman. Critics, like other people, seek what they look for, not what is actually before them. No offense, my joint critics. In my place, they look for my legendary qualities and find originality and brilliance in my most hackneyed tap traps. Not entirely unlike Donald Trump saying you can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and still get elected. We have a distinguished panel of speakers here this afternoon who has Irish and American scholars and the publisher of the Judging Show. I'll introduce each of them in turn uh, and they will speak to you for just over an hour or so. Then we have plenty of time for audience engagement. We're going to start with said publisher Ruth Hegarty, who is the managing editor of the Royal Irish Academy. She's an English graduate from the University College Dublin and has a master's in Anglo Irish literature from Trinity College Dublin, which means she's been to two of the universities in Dublin, and that makes her highly ecumenical, which is easy to me. She established the prison imprint of the Royal Irish Academy, which includes the judging series from Judging Dev to most recently Judging Shaw and Judging Redmond and Carson. The prison imprint has been very popular with the reading public and has built a reputation for very high production values in mind of excellent texts. She will talk to us today about Shaw's Millions. Uh, publishing Judging Shaw. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to talk to you about the Royal Irish Academy and our work with Finton on George Bernard Shaw, which is obviously the context for this roundtable discussion. But I want to place it in the context of politics and public discourse here in the US and internationally. We hear in our media that the Americans are increasingly polarized politically. Republicans are more Republican and less likely to socialize with non-Republicans than before, as are Democrats. Um, and the media we all consume is more partisan, partly because more of the media is via social media, and um, social media itself fuels partisanship. At the same time, even before the rise of the fake news narrative, we've seen a collapse of trust in the media and in the expert, uh, which is both the cause and the effect of this retreat to partisanship. So this was a problem that I was thinking about and um, one way of framing it was that we have a problem with our public sphere. We're talking to each other as opposed to at each other less and we have less in common. We're more distrustful, we're more cynical, we're more angry um, and there are fewer people and fewer institutions that bridge our differences and bring us together. So the Royal Irish Academy clearly has a ring of elitism about it. Were we in Washington, I guess we would be called part of the swamp. But crucial to our identity, going back to our Royal Charter, which was signed by King George III in 1786, um, and at the core of my vision as the Academy's publisher, is that encounter between the elite and the general public or the informed public. And as a small Irish publishing house, we aim to publish some of the best of Irish academic work on its merits. And I'm lucky to count both Lucy and Katrina, as well as Finton, of course, amongst our authors. But in parallel, we aim to bring that best Irish academic work and expertise to the widest possible audience. And we do this not simply by publishing the books, but by running lecture series, speaking tours, conferences, and collaborating in the making of documentaries, cartoons, and drama. And Judging Shaw is the latest in this series of books that embodies that vision. The idea behind this judging series is not so much that a leading authority professes his judgment on a key historical figure, but that the public is given an opportunity to make their own informed judgment on that figure. Not simply by virtue of the author's analysis, but by virtue of the presentation of primary sources within the volume, a kind of transparency of the research process. So if you see Finton referring to something, you can read that letter for yourself and make your own judgment, is the idea behind these. And Barry is going to talk later on about the work that he undertook um, in the archives, identifying the unpublished, the unusual, 
the new and the funny, of course, from Shaw's for the archive for the project. We accompany all these books with programme of events intended to push them out as far and as widely as possible into the public sphere. Um, and this is our New York leg. As Katrina said, we had an exhibition at the Lit Museum. 30,000 people saw it, which is pretty good in, in terms of Dublin population. And we also programmed a Shaw Day Festival which, with a specially commissioned play, lectures, and, and even a cookery demonstration, which was inspired by Shaw's housekeeper's book, Mrs. Layden's Lentils. And unfortunately, there was also, we got to taste the food from, from, the, from the thing and uh, from the demonstration, and it was really, really not very nice. I think vegetarian cooking has come on a lot since the 1970s when it was published. Ireland is at the moment in the midst of marking a decade of centenaries, uh, leading up to the centenary of our, our independence in 1921 and the Civil War which in, in the aftermath. In the judging series we had focused on political leaders, the people who had been involved in the creation and the shaping of the state that emerged. So we covered people like Gaiman de Valera, W.T. Cosgrave, John Redmond um, and Edward Carson. But so there were three things that made me think that George Bernard Shaw would fit after these people. Um, internationally, the great conflict that coincided with these formative years in Ireland was the First World War, and Shaw's writing in opposing it was perhaps his bravest ever. So I saw in him maybe that he could act as an antidote, to potentially, to the military chauvinism that might emerge if we were publishing um, all of these other leaders. And then in the wake of the Great Recession, following the global, global crash in 2008, this series started in 2007, so Judging Dev was the first one just before the crash, and it was absolutely a boom time book in terms of sales and the reaction to it. Um, so just after the, the, in the wake of that recession, and in the context of rising inequality, Shaw's analysis of class and of poverty seemed particularly acute. And then, by comparison with the other great figures in Irish writing, most obviously his fellow Nobel laureates, Shaw had apparently been left behind in contemporary Irish culture. He was barely on the syllabus in, in schools and um, rarely restaged, really, except for a, a revival at the Abbey in the last number of years. There was a series there. And he was seen as desperately unfashionable. And I, I thought that in, even in Ireland, even to be done for Ireland, that it was worth doing it. So there was a need for a reassessment, in my view, um, and I hoped that it would bring forward the acuteness of Shaw's thinking on some of the pressing issues of our time, inequality, pluralism, intolerance, and democratic <laughs> One of the great precedents for this kind of publishing that I aim to do were the Penguin paperbacks in the 1930s. They revolutionised publishing then, and they proved that there could be a mass audience for serious literature and writing. And the great luminary of those pen Penguin paperbacks was George Bernard Shaw. On Shaw's 90th birthday in 1946, Penguin published The Shaw Million, 10 of his greatest hits in print runs of 100,000 copies each. I can only dream of that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and one of the million people that consumed these Shaw paperbacks was a Dublin bus conductor called Samuel O'Toole, the late father to our author Finton O'Toole. So Finton was raised on these paperbacks um, and on the philosophy of these paperbacks that democracy required the highest possible quality of debate and that everybody had a role, even a, a responsibility to contribute to that debate. Finton was the ideal man not simply because he's an eminent theatre historian or because he's one of the country's leading journalists, but because, unusually, he straddles both the world of politics and that of theatre and the arts, as did Shaw. So, judging Shaw isn't going to save us from fake news or Facebook, but he's certainly somebody to turn to, to help us navigate the confusion and the complexity of our age. And through helping push his work out there, and in giving a platform also for Fintan O'Toole, and in our work at the Academy in general with our collaborators at NUI Galway and here in, in Colombia, I hope that we can all be part of a solution, or some form of solution. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes we have a
interstate to try out historic recipes, as we discovered <laughs> with the Shaw Star. I remember on the 150th anniversary of the Great Irish Famine in 1995, where a lot of things were done which should not have been done. But one that was done was at the Parnell Summer School. The organisers decided we should all eat lumber potatoes, which were potatoes eaten by the indigenous inhabitants of 1845. Nobody could stomach them, and the abiding sound was the scraping of these spots into pails on at the end of the day, what a metaphorical <laughs> 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 notion of family consumption. Um, our next speaker is Kerry Walsh, um, who is Associate Professor of English and Director of the Institute of Irish Studies at Fordham University. She's also the convener of the Irish Women Writers Symposium, a recurring series dedicated to the work of Irish and Irish American women writers. She's the editor of the Letters of Sylvia Beach and James Joyce's Dogmas. Her publications have appeared in PMLA, Critical Inquiry, Modernism and Modernity, Air Ireland, and British Film Institute's Film Style series. She's currently working on the Oxford World's Classics edition of James Joyce's Exiles. Her <coughs> topic today is Shaw and Irish Women's Playwriting. Thank you, and let me say thank you, first of all, for allowing me to take a little intermission from work on Joyce's Exiles to work on Shaw. <laughs> I love Joyce's Exiles, but the invitation to work on comedy was, was most welcome. <laughs> In Shaw's one-act play, The Dark Lady of the Sonnets, William Shakespeare asks Elizabeth I to endow a national theater. Such a place, he tells her, funded by the crown, will free him from the low tastes of the public and give him the forum that he needs to do what he does best, which is, he says, write strong parts for women. Shakespeare's pitch, tailored to flatter the powerful queen, is that public funding will allow for more and better women characters on stage. But these women will, of course, be written by Shakespeare, not by women writers. Shaw's play, set four centuries ago, seems particularly relevant to questions about the relationship between public funding and women's ability to work, speak, and be represented on stage that have animated the Irish theater community in recent years. This issue came to a head, as I'm sure many of you in this room know, in 2015, when the Abbey, Ireland's national theater, announced its Waking the Nation program to commemorate the centenary of 1916. Only one out of the 10 of the season's plays was written by a woman. That's Ali White's Me Malser. And this was a specifically commissioned work for children to introduce the Plow and the Stars, or Casey's Plow and the Stars, at in schools. When this imbalance was pointed out, the Abbey's artistic director amplified the insult, commenting, sometimes plays and ideas that we have commissioned by and about women just don't work out. Them's the breaks. Them's the breaks, a phrase that implied that women were not thick-skinned enough to weather the vagaries of theater making, rather than acknowledging their wrong exclusion, became a kind of negative catchphrase for all that was wrong. Strongly calling out this Them's the breaks logic, uh, Fintan O'Toole criticized the multiple failures of oversight in Irish arts governance that had allowed the Abbey to receive 500,000 euros in public funding for such bias program. <laughs> the day before O'Toole's column appeared, had been a powerful one in Irish feminist and theater history. Responding directly to the phrase, waking the nation, set designer Liam Bell and her collaborator, theater manager Sarah Durkin, coined the phrase, waking the feminists, and gathered a large group of women, actors, playwrights, text professionals, directors, and other theater workers on the Abbey stage to deliver testimonials of discrimination and demands for change. Waking the feminists grew into a powerful activist movement winning international recognition for its consciousness raising and advisory functions. One of the movement's key achievements has been the publication of a report on women's status in the profession, Gender Counts, an analysis of gender in Irish theater, 2006 to 2015. Its findings confirm that women are poorly represented in the majority of key roles in the top funded theater organizations in Ireland. And it was in the roles of director and playwright that women's representation was especially low. And one damning finding was that the institutions that received the most public funding had excluded women the most thoroughly. So the opposite of what Shaw had pitched to Queen Elizabeth. This structural inequality is still far from being redressed, but Waking the Feminists has certainly inaugurated a new era of accountability in Irish theater. Waking the Feminists has been an influence on my own research as well, as I'm working on a history of Irish women's playwriting from the 18th century to the present. And of course, while I focus on women, my project also demands a reassessment of the existing male canon. 
where does the trajectory of women's playwriting dovetail with familiar developments in the theatrical history, and where does it depart? What have male playwrights had to say about their female counterparts? Have any of them ever represented on stage the figure of an Irish woman who writes plays? I think you might have a hunch uh, as to who that person will be. The answer to the question is yes. Uh, we find such a character in George Bernard Shaw's Fanny's first play. Fanny's first play was first, first staged at the Adelphi Theatre in London in 1911, and some of the facts that I know about it come from the Irish uh, database compiled by the Irish Theatre Institute. Um, the cute title, Fanny's First Play, might seem to evoke images of a little girl's first trip to the theatre, decked out in patent leather shoes and high expectations, but this is not the play subject at all. Rather, the title refers to the script authored by Fanny O'Dowda, the fictional 19-year-old Irish woman at the heart of Shaw's play. The story of Fanny's composition of the play and of her attempts to have it workshopped, staged, and evaluated anonymously by critics frames the play. This authorship plot fills the stage for approximately the first 20 and last 10 minutes of the play's approximately two and a half hour running time. What the audience gets for the rest of the time is a full-scale production of Fanny's three-act work, a Shavian play that follows the daughter of a well-to-do London family who want only for her to marry well, but who becomes radicalized after experiencing police brutality and spending time in a London jail. Uh, and at one point she utters the line, I'm going to tear it all down. This play within the play is interesting and illuminating on its own terms. It's basically just a regular good old child play. But I wish to turn my attention to the frame narrative about the equally interesting aspiring Irish woman playwright that is on both sides of the play. As Fanny's first play opens, we are introduced to the endearingly ludicrous figure of Count Bogada, a wealthy Irishman who has recently returned his English country home with his daughter Fanny. For the past several decades, the Count informs us, father and daughter have been living in a palace on Venice's Grand Canal, where Fanny's perambulator was a gondola. Odella has become a Count of the Holy Roman Empire, and he has adopted the dress and manner of an 18th century aristocrat, outfitting his daughter in the same fashion. This satire of a certain strain of Irish Catholic aristocrat in exile pretension comically recalls Laura and her father in Sheridan Le Fanu's vampire tale Carmilla with their quaint time stop life in exile in Styria. But though she's a sheltered young woman, Fanny's education has also included two years of her father's alma mater, Cambridge, where she became an active member of the Fabian Society, integrated into modern life, and spent her free time going to see new plays in London. We next learned that the Count has hired professional actors and theater critics as a birthday present for Fanny, explaining that to the hired impresario that she astonished and delighted me by telling me that she had written a play and that the present she wanted was a private performance of it with real actors and real critics. In the Count's mind, this is a perfectly appropriate project for his daughter, and in keeping with the 18th century life they live, Fanny will be staging a closet drama at home, much as Mariah Edgeworth did at Edgeworth's time. And the Count seems particularly cheered by the idea that this production might be something like a court mask. Four critics have been brought in to respond to the play, but Fanny has insisted that the work be performed anonymously so that she can receive feedback from the critics without her authorship being known. One of these critics, the senior critic named Trotter, who Shaw indicates is 50 years old, is buttonholed by Fanny, who tries to engage him in a conversation about modern drama. Trotter is friendly but lightly dismissive, so Fanny changes gears and begins to tell the famous Trotter about his reputation in her in Fabian circles at Cambridge, where she implies that he is respected and discussed, but also mocked as predictable and out of date. By reducing him to a kind of fashion or school, she implies that she can understand him better than he can understand himself. We've discussed you thoroughly, she remarks, slyly asking, you've never discussed yourself, have you? Of course you haven't. So you see, it's no good Trottering at me. After she has cut him down to size in this way, he retaliates by a range of strategies. By referring to Aristotle by the codename Stagirite to confuse her, or the Stagirite, by undermining her Cambridge credentials, she would have been better off at Oxford, he tells her, and by warning her that he will tell her father that she is a very foolish young lady, that she's gotten into a very questionable set, and that the sooner he takes her away from Cambridge and its baby in society, the better. But Fanny continues to rib him about being more uptight in person than he is in writing and not living up to his Epicurean reputation. Sound like a located in that description. The Count at last interrupts their scarring match and the scene ends as all are led off to dinner. This is the last we see of Fanny and her critic Trotter until the play's closing frame. 
Once the curtain drops on Fanny's play, the critics rise, bored and weary, from their seats. The Count, as offended as Fanny predicted he would be, details how the play has wounded him as a parent. Trotter tells him he's overreacting. You take it too seriously. The thing has amusing passages. Dismiss the rest as impertinence. A second critic named Gunn chimes in, also trying to get the Count to relax. It seems to me, he opines, the most ordinary sort of old-fashioned Ibsenite dribble. Trotter returns next with a line that lets us know that he has figured out, or is in the process of figuring out, that Fanny is the true author of the play. Any clever modern girl could turn out that kind of thing by the yard. And by the way, I didn't put this in the paper, but this was first staged anonymously by Shaw as a kind of hoax that might have allowed those seeing it the first time around to think that it had been written by her. But for the time being, Fanny's anonymity persists and the critics hash out the merits of the play, which they find by turns a rotten old-fashioned domestic melodrama full of intellectual pretentiousness and a work that is all as old and stale as a fried fish shop on a winter morning. Possible authors floated for the play include Barry, Canero, and Granville Barker. The critic Gunn thinks he sees in it the hackneyed old Shaw touch, but the critic Vaughn says it can't be because the play, poor as it is, does include the note of passion. And this is something of which Shaw is incapable. This comment distracts the critics into a quarrel about Shaw and whether or not he is able to sustain the note of fashion. And it's in the midst of this debate that they're cut short by the entry of Fanny through the curtains. She's almost in tears. Obviously, from backstage, she has overheard that her play was not exactly a hit. As she steps forward, her first act is to apologize. I'm so sorry, gentlemen. And it was such a success when I read it to the Cambridge Baby and Society. With this seemingly partial acknowledgement of authorship, Trotter pounces. He reveals to the crowd that he had already guessed that she wrote it herself. Fanny now admits as much to the general amazement and consternation of those assembled. And then she melts down in a pool of shame and self recrimination And you all think it beastly. You hate it. You think I'm a conceited idiot and that I shall never be able to write anything decent. Fanny's interest, even in her distress, seems to be in her growth as a writer. She has staged this event so that she can receive mentorship by exposing her work to experts. At the sight of Fanny's tears, however, a wave of sympathy carries away the critics, who adjust their critical tone in the way that they deem suitable to a wealthy amateur authoress. No, no, says Vaughn. Why, well, I, I was just saying that it might have been written by Pinero. Fanny perks up. Then says he guessed Barker. She perks up further. But now, the youngest of the critics, says he guessed Shaw and calls it a jolly good little play. First rate little bit of work. When the author was assumed to be male, the play was honestly excoriated, but now the same work is given a patronizing round of compliments. Vaughn, with maudlin solemnity, advises her to sustain the note of passion and you'll do great things. This piece of feedback is clearly the kind Fanny has been seeking a vote of confidence in her talent. She asks for confirmation Do you think I have a future? But this question is not given any space to be answered as Trotter cuts in with the words, You have a past, Mr. Dowdell. What he means by this cryptic comment is that the scenes in her play that depict the heroine's time in jail are so convincing that in order to write them, Fanny must have spent some time in jail herself. So, after sniffing her out as a playwright, Trotter next outs her as a suffragette, and she reveals that yes, she did a month in prison with Lady Constance Lytton, and it is the thing she is most proud of. So just at the moment when Fanny's future as a playwright is floated, Trotter distracts by bringing up her past as a suffragette. Trotter, no fan of suffragettes, then asks Fanny, is that any reason why you should stuff naughty plays down my throat? To which she retorts, yes, it'll teach you what it feels like to be forcibly fed, equating the act of making male critics watch her play with the violence of force feeding of suffragist women by the British police. Shaw comes close to ending the play on this connection between suffrage and women's playwriting, and on the standoff between Fanny and Trotter. But the tension is released and a lighter note prevails as the curtains are drawn, revealing the actors on stage. And the characters in the outside frame joke that if they can't agree about the play, at least they can agree on the quality of the acting. And the last sight we see is of both Fanny and the critics moving amongst the cast, shaking their hands and congratulating the actors. That Shaw should dramatize the difficulties faced by an Irish woman playwright is somewhat surprising. Off stage, he was not known to be especially encouraging of women playwrights. Though a committed feminist, he tended to celebrate the role of the actress specifically of the actress manager, because her work complemented rather than competed with his. These actress managers could stage his plays. Scholars including J.L. and Gaynor, Carrie Powell, D. 
D.A. Hadfield, Margaret Stentz, have all documented Shaw's tense relationships with his writers and actors, like Janet, an actor like Janet H. Church or um, someone like George Egerton, when they attempted to write for the stage. Nonetheless, despite his limitations in appreciating women as authors, in Fanny's first play, Shaw does provide an insightful portrayal of the frustrations of one female playwright in her efforts to establish herself in this male-dominated field. And perhaps it would be a suitable work for a feminist director in Ireland to revive now. And I think, um, you know, it was revived a lot during the 20s and 30s. It was on almost every year, the Abbey in the 20s, and quite a lot in the 30s. And then The Gate did a production in 1972 that I think was probably a feminist, a second wave feminist era production, but it hasn't been done a whole lot uh, since then, unless I'm missing something. Possible. I'll close with one more point that suggests Shaw is our contemporary. Nicholas Green has argued that Shaw is an unacknowledged presence in Irish theatre. Because although his works, including Fanny's first play, have often been produced in his home country, they have not become part of the national consciousness in the same way that O'Casey's or Sings and Beckett's or that. This same status, that of unacknowledged presence, is also true of most of the plays written by women in Ireland. Their works have been produced on Irish stages more often than we realize, but they've almost never been acknowledged as part of the national canon by being kept in print, by being revived, by being taught in schools, or by being discussed in scholarship. The reason, the reason usually given for Shaw's exclusion from this Irish consciousness is his supposedly insufficient nationalism. But it is also the case that among the canonical male playwrights, Shaw is the most vocal feminist. Perhaps it is his feminism, or feminism in general, whether that of Shaw or the Irish female playwright, that is the true other to the Irish theater, the presence that cannot be acknowledged on its national stage. Lucy McDermott has shown how energized Lady Gregory was by her friendship and collaboration with Shaw, and how much Lady Gregory relished the chance to show up the Dublin Castle censors by staging his work. Lady Gregory was not the only Irish woman playwright to find Shaw's example galvanizing, and I'm going to close with some words from the Irish novelist and playwright Kate O'Brien, who saw Man and Superman in Dublin when she was a student at UCD in 1917. I went to the theater that Saturday afternoon, a nervous, green, convent school creature, just up from Limerick, and I suppose I came out looking much the same. But in fact, I came out afraid to breathe. I felt as if I'd been filled with some very brittle, burning kind of light. I've never forgotten the shock of it or the tingling refreshment. O'Brien would go on to write a prize-winning play in the Shavian Manor, Distinguished Villa of 1926 a work about an unplanned pregnancy, cross-class marriage, and suicide, which was produced at London's Haymarket before coming to the Abbey in 1929. Later, O'Brien would imitate Shaw's pattern of developing relationships with powerful actress managers by penning a play for Catherine Cornell, That Lady, a Spanish historical romance with swashbuckling heroine based on her own novel. That work succeeded on Broadway in 1950 and was adapted as a film starring Olivia de Havilland in 1955. For a queer woman writer like O'Brien, Shaw's fiery, dominating women like Anne Whitefield in Man and Superman may have provided an unforgettable erotic spectacle. But equally, Shaw's career as a playwright opened up the possibility of a path not taken by Irish theater, the path where feminism and playwriting belong together. to the two boys who now run the Apple Theatre are both raving feminists. <laughs> we'll make sure that they um, launch a revival as we um, Our next speaker is Dr. Adrian Patterson, who is a lecturer in English at the National University of Ireland at Galway. With a particular interest in interactions between the arts and the fantasy actor, recent work into his articles in Yates, Found and Joyce, a multimedia exhibition, Yates and the West, and a special double edition of the French scholarly journal you pronounce it Adrian because I can't. He really. He really. Yeah, he something. <laughs> Devoted to modernism, co edited with Christine Hernier. This summer, he takes up a research fellowship at the Harry Ransom Center at uh, the University of Texas at Austin for a project about orality and technology for poets on air. And his presentation has the intriguing title of The Smiling Sewing Machine, Yes, the Children. Thank you very much. Um, Katrina and Eileen Gulli and all the people at Columbia took this wonderful event together um, and give me a chance to say a few words. Um, most especially because uh, I received a different kind of invitation recently, and rather more unusual. Um, I was contacted by a company called Kim Keen, who are a kind of candle and perfume 
Atelier in Norway. Um, and they wanted my input on a new product, which is a scented candle they were calling the autograph tree, named after the spreading copper beech tree at Lady Augusta Gregory's house in Gorkland. And you can see the product there, it's real. This is, this is it's surreal, but nonetheless true. Um, this is the tree, I'm sure many of you know it, that, that among many initials carved on that tree, including the composer Ethel Smythe and Violet Martin, of Somerville and Ross, uh, James Singh, John O'Casey, we've heard mentioned already, and uh, of this parish, the irascible New York lawyer, John Quinn. Um, you have two very famous sets of letters. Uh, on the right, enormously, you can see this dominating flourish, GPS, there. And rather more modestly, on the left, uh, sort of there, in amongst the moss, very hard to see, is this distinctive monogram, WBY. Um, Shaw's is larger, <laughs> it dominates the tree in some ways. A broadcast its essential sureness to the world. Um, and the commission that I was, I was asked to think about this autograph tree made me think about the two together and what we might learn. Um, there's two more different writers than these two singular Irishmen who can hardly be invented. Um, but they were contemporaries whose paths crossed and recrossed. And the theatre scholar Nicholas Green, who's already been mentioned, sketches what he calls a Venn diagram of overlapping interests flanked by distinctively divergent attitudes. It seems about right, although it's hard to imagine either of them kind of quietly confined to any kind of dialogue. Um, but precisely these overlapping interests actually become kind of burning obsessions with both. And Augusta Gregory's autograph tree, it seems to me a living illustration of how often these obsessions involved important, influential, and for the writers concerned, often infuriatingly independent women. Um, chief amongst these women is Florence Farr, uh, an actress, musician, and writer involved with both WBY and GBS, both amorously and artistically whose talented intellectual independence inspired and frustrated her. Um, her voice matters in this story. I mean this literally, because she was known especially through her skills and actor as a speaker for her beautiful voice. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge, even if only briefly, the influence of some of these women, and consider in particular how much these shared obsessions of these two men, uh, in particular interest in socialism, in Wagner, in uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, in the philosophy of him, uh, connect to a deeper bedrock of concern with uh, the voice and the music. You can't consider WBY and GBS uh, without thinking about the 1894 production at the Avenue Theatre in London of two plays, Yeats's The Land of Heart's Desire and Shaw's the Arms, uh, sorry, Arms in the Man. These plays seem to really have very little in common. Yeats's play is a kind of one act uh, domestic drama set in a misty island of the remote past in which a fairy child's weird singing lures an unsatisfied woman to her death. Uh, Shaw's swashbuckling ironical fable, um, death actually comes as part of an offstage battle in the early Balkan Wars of the late 19th century, uh, and the dramatic intrusion comes from a kind of cynical, mustachioed Swiss officer uh, as he bursts through the window in a kind of dramatic beginning. Um, so there's not a lot in common you would have thought, but both were produced by Florence Fong, uh, who played the servant girl Luca, in Shaw's play, and trained her niece Dorothy, Dorothy Paget for the part of the fairy child in the Otis play. Um, the occasion of, of Bernard Shaw's premiere and his curtain call appearance uh, made him yet said a kind of consummate contemporary. Uh, he said he was the most formidable man of modern letters, and even most drunken of medical students knew it. Um, <laughs> but typically, his own reaction to Shaw's work was quite mixed, and here's where my sewing machine comes in. I listened to Arms and the Man with admiration and hatred. It seemed to me inorganic, logical straightness, and not the crooked road of life. Yet I stood aghast before its energy. The discovery that it is possible to write with great effect without music, without style, either good or bad. Presently, I had a nightmare that I was haunted by a sewing machine that clipped and shone, but the incredible thing was that the machine smiled, smiled perpetually. Yet I delighted in Shaw, the formidable man. He could hit my enemies and the enemies of all I loved as I could never hit. There was no living author that was dear to me, could ever. You can see a, a kind of strong sense of attraction and repulsion here. Instead of musical straight of logic, instead of style and hand-sewn textile, a smiling, grimacing sewing machine. Gates' uh, unconscious makes sure a kind of emblem, a grimacing emblem of the advance of technology. And about this dream, I imagine Freud would have quite a lot to say, um, but so I think would Karl Marx. Uh, for the vision it presents, illustrates, I think, obviously a, a profound difference in temperament and style, but also in, a, in a, their approaches to socialism. Because both men were, were socialists. It's not news to say so of Shaw, uh, who's you know, known for his connection with the Fabian Society, 
and a veteran of campaign platforms by this time, uh, wrote in, in, or produced in 1927 uh, a book he called The Young Woman's Guide to Socialism. Uh, but Gates' socialism is, is often forgotten, but also, I think, interesting. He said that he turned socialist because of William Morris, whom he called my chief of men, and indeed it was Morris's Hammersmith House in London that Yeats and Shaw met. Shaw recorded dryly in his diary in February 1888, an Irishman named Yeats talked about socialism a good deal. Um, now, Shaw's play Man and Superman draws a distinction between a poetic socialist and a scientific one, which doesn't quite fit the case, but certainly I think that Yeats draws on Morris's sense that if you abolish capital, society would return to kind of communities of makers making beautiful things with their hands as opposed to a kind of scientific socialism that, that embraces industrial, industrialization and labor-saving technologies, like the sewing machine that so vividly represents Shaw. Um, it's not a clear-cut distinction, because actually Shaw's ambivalence about technology is manifest. It's, some of his modern characters in Man and Superman have nightmares about it. Tanner remarks to his, the driver of his car, I'm a slave of that car, and of you too, I dream of the accursed thing at night. The devil remarks in the same play that actually modern man is not really interested in kind of clumsy typewriters, bungling loads of motors and tedious bicycles, but actually they're nothing compared to the technology of war, the weapons of destruction. Man's heart is in his weapons, which in this time of you know, chemical um, warfare and, and, and guns uh, is an interesting point. Um, sewing matters though, uh, partly because it's known to be uh, or considered to be women's work. And at Morris's house, his daughter May uh, ran a textile studio where Yates' his sister Lily worked for years and also uh, Florence Farm. Um, her interest in textiles is probably evident from, from um, this kind of photograph. She's <coughs> here playing um, in, a, in a kind of weird sub suburban pastoral play called A Sicilian Idyll uh, in 1890. But that's what put her thrilling voice on display for these two men. Said Yates, I made through these performances a close friend and a discovery that was to influence my life. Um, and he encourages her to join the Golden Dawn, uh, the kind of occult magical order where her, her gifts for speech are much appreciated in gesture. Uh, Shaw was quicker in pursuit and, and kind of struck up an even closer relationship with her, which included a blizzard of contrary love letters, and he tried to make an Ibsenite actress out of her. Um, Anyway, it was socialism's perceived concern, uh, a lack of concern, sorry, with spiritual nourishment that caused Yeats to give it up. Uh, but such nourishment might be found elsewhere. So, not in gods directly, maybe, but in an art full of gods, maybe. Uh, and in this vein, both Yeats and Shaw were devotees of Wagner. Um, Shaw's 1898 book, Perfect Wagnerite, recast Wagner's great opera of Ring of the Nibelungs as an unwitting socialist parable. Uh, where the seizing of the Rhine gold becomes a symbol of, of capitalist avarice and Siegfried's resistance proclaims the coming revolution. Uh, he'd spent five years as a provocative music critic, um, taking the pseudonym Corno de Bassetto, um, or a kind of little basset horn. Uh, and for the first time, this moniker GBS is where it occurs first. Um, he said, I believed I could make music criticism readable even by the death, uh, and um, more seriously said, my method, my system, my tradition is founded upon music. Now, Yeats, we don't usually associate with music, but he, in Paris, he was taken to the opera by his would-be loving Lord Gaunt, uh, a woman so obsessed with Wagner that she named her daughter Isolde after the Celtic legend of Tristan and Zola told in Wagner's opera. And Yeats was obsessed with this opera. His play, The Shadowy Waters, tells a kind of Wagnerian story, like the Flying Dutchman we've heard mentioned already. Uh, centering on the ghostly ship and two lovers that are swayed instead of by a love draft that's interesting as older, but a heart that plays on earth and music. Um, Florence Farr's at the centre of this kind of thing because uh, she knows about Italian opera and actually acts in the first performance of Yeats' Countess Kathleen, uh, which she wants to make into an opera, at, uh, chanting Yeats' lyrics to her heart. And this marks the beginning of her experiments with uh, this instrument here, the psaltery which was made especially for her, and for about 11 years she, she travels with the Yates doing concerts and lecture tours and other things, and at that time they had a brief affair. Um, this new art Shaw deprecated, uh, says Yates only thought it was new because he does not go to church, but nonetheless her musical skill was an important part of it. Um, what, she published a book called The Musical Speech, which promotes this, um, and played in The Shadowy Waters a set 
brought this new instrument into the center of this opera in a kind of stripped down, low fat Wagnerian Gesamte Kunstwerk. Um, song mattered, um, not just speech in plays, which has contemporary relevance in a world in which Bob Dylan wins the Nobel Prize. Um, I'll, I'll skip ahead, but uh, the, the Abbey Theatre was founded in Wagnerian terms. A woman called Annie Horneman um, was herself an Abbey Wagnerian, and founds is actually the benefactor of both the season of plays in which Yates and Shaw appear on stage for the first time and for the Abbey Theatre for its first few years of its life. Um, and it was founded because, <laughs> in Wagner's image, because it's an example, I think, of artistic integrity and opposition to censorship. Um, and Shaw becomes very useful in fights about censorship um, with the Abbey. His, um, the Abbey Theatre takes up his play showing up of, of Ranko Posnick, banned in 1909 as blasphemous by England's Lord Chamberlain, uh, and takes it to the Abbey Theatre, which I think kind of gives you an idea of, um, sorry, that's my picture of Yates together with Lady Gregory. Lady Gregory becomes at this time the kind of focal point, another kind of interesting triangle between Yates, Shaw, and a woman, in this case Lady Gregory, really does an awful lot of work to bring those two people together. Um, the Abbey Theatre puts on this play partly because it can demonstrate defiance of censorship and a kind of national independence in standing up against the castle, the British instrument of government in Ireland. Um, and Yeats makes sure, when he founds an Irish Academy of Letters much later, to combat uh, the 1929 Act of the Free State, the Act of Censorship, that Shaw will be part of this and makes him president, in fact. Um, they ban works by writers like Wells, Shaw himself, D.H. Lawrence, and Samuel Beckett. Um, so Shaw is important in this fight. And part of the reason for that is, I think, Yates and Shaw recognise each other a fellow Nietzsche. Um, and Nietzsche becomes a shared obsession with those. It's perhaps only in such um, terms that Yates finds pleasure in Shaw's plays. I've forgotten, I've had this wonderful image of Shaw and Lady Gregory in an automobile, very early kind of trap of things. Um, but anyway, this is a, a, a longish letter I want to just refer to. Did you see Bernard Shaw that Shaw's letter in the Times a couple of days ago? Logical, audacious, and convincing. A really wonderful letter, at once violent and persuasive. This is Yates to France Bar. He knew his opponent's case as well as his own, and that's just what men of his kind usually do not know. I saw Caesar and Cleopatra with Forbes Robinson in it twice this week, and I'm really delighted in what I never thought to be with work of his moved. There is vulgarity, plenty of it, but such gay heroic delight in the serviceable mass. I have had but style and distinction was not such a barbarian in the barricades. I'm quite convinced, by the way, that the whole play is chaffing you in your Egyptian period, and that you were the Cleopatra who offered that libation of wine to the table. Speaks. That phrase, gay heroic delight, is straight up Nietzsche after the philosopher's book, Gay Science. And Yates had been under, under Nietzsche the strong enchanted spell ever since John Quinn, the New York boy, had given him copies of Thus Spake Now with History, the Twilight of the Islands, um, and Nietzsche Contra um, Now, many people have seen Nietzsche's biggest influence on Yates, I think you might say the same for sure. Um, that play, Banco Posnet, is the weirdest kind of emblem of Irish nationalism. It's an all American gun-toting, horse-rustling, western, blasphemous drama made kind of directly in response to seeing as a playboy. Um, but it's probably the kind of weird Nietzschean energy of its crowd scenes that make it go. Um, anyway, they're both aware that Nietzsche is full of music that, um, in Shaw's play, Man and Superman, um, he includes uh, Don Giovanni from Mozart, causes this dream sequence of Don Juan and Hell later played by Franz Farr, and an argument about Nietzsche falling out of the farm, in fact. Um, anyway, Nietzsche brings them together, therefore, in interesting ways, and it seems to me that it's another thing that joins them together. Um, the role of women in this bears a, 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 a certain uncomfortable interest, perhaps, in the, in the hashtag Me, Me Too era. Um, both men had a kind of proprietary interest in actresses in telling them what to do. Um, and in this case, prototype of this was from as far. We've heard that Shaw does this with lots of um, uh, players. Uh, he tends to be unable to almost write a play at all without writing lots of love letters to the woman actress who's going to play the central part. Um, but and Shaw's letters so far, as he grooms her into play a professional stage actress, showed him trying to play the role of kind of Sven Dolly, which is a role his surrogate father, Sidney Lee, had played. He played a similar role to his mother, coaching her on the method of voice production. It seems to me that matters because actually Pygmalion is not really a play about a cockney flower girl at all. It's a 
It's a play about Shaw's relationship with Thor, who is constantly badgering about elocution and vowel sounds and these other things. Um, and like Eliza Doolittle, Thor had other ideas uh, and asserts her independence, and it must have been doubly irritating when he lost her and her voice, not only to Egyptology, but to Yeats and to the Psalter. Um, not that she remained there, of course, despite considerable successes, Yeats too despaired of directing her independent spirit and muttered long before Beckett that actors really ought to be put into barrels. <laughs> I have been sitting on a chalk egg for years, he lamented, and eventually far retires to Sri Lanka to teach school and study Eastern philosophy. And she's depicted in Yeats's poem, All Souls Night, as kind of interestingly poised on the cusp between chance and choice. Um, in conclusion, what does all this mean? That, that, up to a point, it seems to me that both are interested in integrity and in truth, but not necessarily truth that's found in logical arguments. Um, Shaw, so often the um, cynic when it comes to religion, says, actually proclaims a kind of conversion uh, through music. And he says, rising on music, he says this, Handel has this power. When he sets the words fixed in his everlasting seat, the atheist is struck down. God is there, fixed in his everlasting seat by Handel. You may despise what you like, but you cannot contradict Handel. <laughs> We remember that rebellious thief, Pango Bosnit, shamed, was shamed into belief not by love or logic, but the otherworldly power of a woman and child. And Yeats had observed that Shaw was haunted by the mystery that he flapped. He's an atheist who trembles in the haunted horror. But I think he understood that Shaw recognized the importance of conviction and idealism, even belief in making up truth. Um, and Yeats, this is where I finish, as Yeats lies dying in January 1939, he was still thinking about Shaw's plays and writing to the Abbey, you should put his latest play on. But arranging his most fundamental thoughts, he puts his remark to philosophy in remarkably similar terms to Shaw. Believing that man must embody truth, he cannot know it. That logic and abstract argument is not life. He concludes, you can refute Hegel, but not the saint or the song of Sitwell. It's not quite the same emphasis. Shaw's example of Handel it, it, you know, gives a kind of weight and elemental power of a chorus of religious texts. And yet his Song of Sixpence is a kind of inconsequential no nonsense. But nonetheless, I think it um, argues that truth is not necessarily found directly through argument. Um, so what does this mean? I mean, lots of people think that Shaw's attitude to art is instrumental. Uh, I don't mean that he just has an appreciation of instrumental music, but it, music was instrumental because it does things in the world. Um, in the modern world, you call this goal directed, I suppose, which revives that old argument about means and ends. And you might say, I suppose, that the edge is more interested in the means uh, the medium, and Shaw in the ends. But yet, I think both were convinced of the revelatory power of the voice as medium, especially when combined with music. And for both, art becomes about more than just argument, and might um, believe real world, worlds beyond. Considering together, it's clear that no matter how Shaw completely posed as a skeptic, like Yeats, he was a committed and extraordinary enthusiast, and even uh, a believer. They, in this, they both owe uh, to the idea of by the way, I'm still working on the, on the perfume, the odour of the autograph tree. Um, I'll take suggestions. I don't know how on earth you might predict GBS and WY in, in smell. Um, it seems to me their smells would be kind of distinctive and pungent, but not maybe as foully antithetical as we might think. Very soon, and the Abbey must commission a play called The Stealing Away of Flying's Far Out. Many wonderful players. Our next speaker is Barry Hulliman, uh, who is an archivist at the Hardingham Library of Galway. He's the editor of the forthcoming volume Navigating Ireland's Theatre Archive Theory of Practice and Performance. He teaches theatre history and also archival literacy skills. <laughs> in a range of disciplines. He's also a final year PhD candidate for discipline of English and Roy Bowie, and he will speak about finding Shaw sure archival traces and legacies of GPS. Good okay. afternoon, everyone. So, yeah, part of my role with um, uh, the book was as an archival researcher and an English researcher, uh, and of course, having this wonderful roadmap to work from, which was Finkel's manuscript and book, uh, and to be given those wonderful tasks of populating it camera documents, um, and also trying to illustrate Shaw's uh, I mean, personality, character, achievements, uh, and also problems. Uh, those dark sides that you guys have seen the panelists here uh, illustrate. Um, 
it, it, the task was not so much actually judging Shaw, it was finding Shaw. Um, which Shaw do you look for? You know, there is certainly no singular um, Shaw. Um, and I think what became clear from the sources was a person or figure at least who's consciously self-cultivating uh, and reinventing his own identity and persona across the globe and across uh, generations as well. Um, access to newly uh, available and newly digitized archives have immensely. Um, collections like the Abbey Theatre Digital Archive, Amy Y. Galway, the London School of Economics, um, the New York Public Library, the whole raft of resources uh, were sourced and uh, published in the book, and uh, largely published for the first time as well, so people get a different sense of maybe what um, uh, show those images he had from his plays looked like, what the people he was writing to, the circuit he moved in, uh, what were those conversations like. So perhaps can remove a bit of speculation about what uh, was happening. So what I'll give an overview of today is this reassessment of the evidence around Shaw's remembrance after his death, uh, as well as the use of Shaw's identity and recognition by others within his lifetime uh, in terms of nationalist expression, primarily around the Abbey Theatre, um, and how he used his image to propagate certain ideas within his lifetime and again after his, his lifetime as well. So around staging not just an Irish drama, but an Irish drama uh, of Shavian uh, constructs. Again, uh, a little earlier. Um, well, okay, yeah, so I contribute to the question is Shaw our contemporary uh, or still our contemporary, uh, as the case may be, as if he was not at all. So, to begin a little earlier, on New Year's Day in 1933, the New York Times carried a front page, a large front page image, which was a sketch of a well dressed and be suited man uh, with graying hair, a long and green grey beard, a moustache, a broad laughing mouth. It was a figure clearly relishing the focus of attention, you know, the centre of attention. But Looking away from the viewer uh, who was reading this paper, the figure's profile was captivating, if not also slightly uh, devilish uh, in appearance. Um, and this is said image, but the caption on this image on the front page of the New York Times simply write, this is not GBS of Dublin, or GB Show of Dublin, unless you have any ideas that he was um, uh, playing with the Abbey Theatre at this time. So the article clarified that the image was actually then, but also famous Abbey Theatre comedian actor Barry Fitzgerald, who was part of the visiting Abbey Theatre company on a major tour of the United States, uh, spanning 1932 and 1933, and were playing on the Martin Beck Theatre on Broadway at this time. But taking on Shaw's attributes was an absolutely deliberate act on Fitzgerald's part, um, and in portraying Shavian sensibilities in the role of Alcock, um, the head of a declining anglo irish Protestant family in the heart of Lynette Robinson's play at the Big House, which Abbey was producing at the time. So the play examines the political complexities of Anglo Irish relations during the War of Independence. We saw the family of Big House of Barry Donald become the target of an IRA burning. And Barry Fitzgerald, I think, in taking on this shaving caricature, connected Irish American audiences to the play through the Ireland's uh, to the image of Ireland's most recognisable figure, G.B. Shaw, but also situated Shaw as a symbol for the Anglo Irish Protestant upper class itself. But Lynette Robinson's sympathetic portrayal of an Anglo Irish family in the play. Uh, I think forced the so choices between country, Ireland, and their culture, English and Protestantism. So presenting an alternative perspective on the narrative uh, of an emerging nation in questions of, of Irish nationalism and drama. But the local New York press uniformly picked up and commented on this phantom Shaw figure. I mean, they reminded audience it was not actually Shaw at all, um, but yet could be seen upon the stage of the American Black Theatre, uh, which was um, right here, and this image from Arthur Shields is archived in Inouye Galway, who was stage manager of that tour. Um, so it gave us a curiosity about even this someone in the likeness of Shaw, that he was still uh, somehow a presence uh, in this play. So in terms of marketing the play and self-promotion by Fitzgerald, it was an interesting decision um, in trying to make the play appear more Irish and also more attractive to all local audiences, the Irish-American diaspora in the city. Um, and the use of Shaw in it, the use of Shaw in terms of absorbing or appropriating Irishness and Irish national causes around the setting of the Abbey Theatre was also seen in a fundraising campaign in 1913 um, to repatriate the paintings for Hugh Lane uh, to Ireland. And Adrian already mentioned the, the Blanco Posner production that uh, in 1909 came to, um, uh, came to Dublin to the Abbey Theatre with band in London. So, again, from Arthur's archive, we see the top image here is of the cast of Blanco Posner, and it's a linen. Uh, Table clocks, the deluxe uh, item that was sold in the foyer of the production of Blanco Puzzle at the Royal Court Theatre in London. But yet, the play was banned in London in 1913, so this begs the question as to how this was going to be 
was it an impulse? Was it a club production and so it was escaping the censure of, um, uh, of the Lord Chamberlain? Um, again, just to jump back to, in a sense of how the image uses US dollars as the currency to which the fundraising was taken, um, again, to repatriate the Hewlett payments as a great gift for Ireland. So again, drawing on the romantic or idealized vision of the American West to rank the positive as uh, a metaphor for Irish cultural nationalism through securing the paintings as this gift for Ireland. And again, the link to Shaw again is a contemporary nod to the position of him. It's a contemporary, um, and this is something I've seen throughout the sources uh, as the years and decades go on, it's continually being made contemporary. So again, within the, the, uh, the theatre of digital archive, for the first time the stage management files uh, of the early period were, were, were made accessible to scholars. And this allowed us to look at the, um, the theatricality of Shaw, the event constructed around and supporting the production of Shaw's drama, the producers, the designers, the collaborators, the directors. And again, you get a sense of some screenshots here from uh, the, uh, the Abbey Digital Archive at Galway. Just a scale of things, just on Shaw alone. So we have something close to 2,000 annotated, annotated pages of transcripts, um, 38 set designs, 1,200 pages of stage management files, and so on. And just to get a sense of a screenshot of the following photographs over there, you might recognize from the book from Rudolf Cyril Cusack, in arms of the man, just on the left of the screen there. Um, so again, we get this um, a huge new a range of sources to look at Shaw and new from. So he had. Oh, sorry, the first production of John Bull's Other Island, for example, premiered at the Abbey in autumn 1916 um, and featured a set design um, of a highly romanticised vision of, of the world of Ireland. Um, but it's clearly, I think, Glenda Lock in County Wicklow. We can see two lakes in the background, the round tower of St. Kevin in the foreground. Um, so again, these, these symbols of, of pagan Ireland, pre Christian Ireland, um, at the outset of the Irish identity, new Irish identity. Was taken. But again, as we see later on, Shaw had, and again, these are shots from Candy at the Abbey, uh, the early years, being so wonderful to put these shots out there. And again, we get a sense of the damage that the fire caused at the Abbey in 1951. So these are lighting plots. And again, many of these are published in the book as well. So again, the, this is the, the mechanics, the great effort it was to actually take these hugely verbose plays and actually stage them and get these beautiful costumes. So after Shaw's death, um, or moving towards that time at least 1950, of course he had complex opinions and ideas about his own effigy legacy commemoration. He famously discarded his birthday by Dee Cole uh, and often played down the celebration of his birthday. It's a reporter in Scotland on the occasion of his 60th birthday that he was not young enough to be really proud of, of his age and not old enough to have become really popular in England yet. <laughs> so Shaw even rebuffed the idea of having a commemorative plaque to be mounted on the house of his birth in Sing Street in Dublin, saying he was strictly only consent to biographical details that he himself had pre approved on the plaque. He warned it must bear no inscription of opinion as to my merits or demerits, and must state only the unquestionable fact that I once lived in this house. Considering his own mortality, Shaw made a joke that his ghost would be enormously amused if his statue, uh, which is on screen here, passed by the, in bronze by the sculptor Paolo Trubetskoy, who we place on College Green in Dublin, next to the statues of Oliver Goldsmith and Henry Bracken, figures for both Trinity College alumni. And Symbolic of the former classical education that Shaw himself did not receive. Uh, Shaw's wife Charlotte took great efforts to ensure that Dublin would possess in her words a good portrait of her husband, leaving a portrait by John Collier to the National Gallery during his lifetime. So even during his lifetime, there's an act of curation of his image and preserving it within Dublin. After he died in November 1950, the reaction and revival of Shaw's work is interesting to begin to investigate. As a sign perhaps of changing tastes and theatrical movements, by 1977, the British playwright John Osborne, author of plays like Back in Anger, dismissed GBS as an inept writer of Victorian melodramas. So, but yet at this time, new generations of Irish and British audiences attained new appreciations for Shaw Theatre in production through a spate of major revivals, uh, and the ability of, of GBS's work to adapt and speak to new globalising and modernising audiences in the 1960s. Um, was it, I think it worked to reinvigorate the shaping of production in terms of performance and practice. And again, it's very large, it would suggest a way of directors, stage managers, designers, uh, movement coaches, and voice coaches, which were beginning to be employed by major theatres in Dublin, and in particular, of course, Patrick Mason coming into uh, the Abbey Theatre in the 1970s. But again, closer to home, we see it being visually reproduced. And again, the shot of the autograph tree on the on screen uh, drew it reproduced this in entirety in the front cover of. Um, 
uh, their program for a season of annual Irish theatre in 1977, the same year that uh, John Osborne was dismissing uh, a show as being irrelevant. So in Belfast at the same time, Corkmore and director Mary O'Malley was staging Shaw satire on the Irish question, John Bull was on Ryland in August 71, the same week that the British policy of Operation Demetrius is forced internment without trial against Republican suspects. Uh, and you can see the program on screen there, along with uh, the screen uh, shot of the cast as well. Um, but while the state was being performed in Dublin, Belfast critics commented seemingly about the irony that in the backdrop to conflict and in the backdrop to internment, that the play had acted to blow the cobwebs off Shaw uh, and delighted in having a Shaw revival having him finally reached Belfast. Slightly later again, uh, in 1977, the Abbey at the Peacock stage um, was staging Mrs. Warren's profession uh, in the first, first production of the play at the National Theatre, directed by Patrick Mason. Um, and you see a later poster from 2000 on the right as well. But Mason brought the setting of the play forward from its late 19th century setting to 1925, the year of its first production, um, and staged the 1920s jazz and flapper Gatsby esque setting. Um, and again, it was about making a contemporary. Uh, using the experimental stage of the Peacock studio space um, at the Abbey. But the press remarked at the time of the paucity of Irish female parents and the lack of female voices on the stage, and that somehow they attributed the stage of Mrs. Warren's profession as an antidote to this, not um, perhaps seemingly unaware of Shaw, uh, of the being a male, of the male director as well as Patrick Mason. Um, and again, to show the lead actresses, so simply by virtue of having two prominent female roles, uh, this was seen as an idea to lack of Irish female writing. But again, about rooting this play on rooting Shaw back in Dublin, this is photographed taken off in the Craigie and um, Kate Flint, the actors at Shaw's Garden, at the gardens of Shaw's home in So, just to conclude, in a filmed interview at his home in Ao St. Lawrence in Hertfordshire, a 90 year old Shaw, um, yeah, delighted at the cameras who were there present, British Pathé came to his home to record. Uh, well, what seems to be a farewell uh, gesture or a farewell address from Sean. You can see the quote on screen, it's very poignant, where he says, It's very pleasant to have seen you all here and to think that you are my audience because I'm a born actor myself. I like an audience, I'm like a child in that respect. Well, goodbye, 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 all of you. So, again, with this stage of the 90 year old, he's regaling having an audience. Um, this is the Pan Am poster from the 1960s, um, <laughs> where somehow it's the denial of sane scholars and shows. So, those transatlantic uh, exchanges of cultural appropriation of Shaw didn't stop when he changed from a smiling, brash figure uh, portrayed by Barry Fitzgerald in the front page of the New York Times in 1933 uh, to this figure here, a slightly more grandfatherly figure uh, by the 1960s, again after his death. So perhaps the question is that it's, it's not the question of Shaw being our contemporary still, it's the fact that we are perhaps still his audience. Great advertisement for the archives in Galway University, I have to say. I know what that's all about, but it is wonderful to see all of these riches being made available, and of course, your contribution to the book is considerably very important. Our last speaker is Lucy McDermott, who is Mary Fazé Baldassari, Professor of English at Montclair State University, one of the longest and most beautiful titles in the academic world. She's the author of a of eight books, most recently at Home of the Revolution, one of them is set in 1916 published by the Royal Irish Academy, uh, and poets in the Pop Dinner, the literary history of a new published by Oxford in 2013. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, Coleman Centre, the Prince Collins and Rogers at the New York Public Library, and the National Endowment for the Manage. She's currently completing a book of contemporary Irish poetry, and her topic today is Shaw, the Irish controversialist. Lucy. Thank you, Katrina, for the introduction, and thank you, Dan, for organizing this. I have to stand up for this. So, um, it feels better. Uh, a number of years ago, I published a book called The Irish Art of Controversy, and I've stolen from that book for my talk today, and I haven't stolen shamelessly because I feel a little bit of shame, um, but I don't feel a whole lot of shame because I think there are at most two people in the room who have read the book, and one of them probably didn't read it on, but the other one has probably forgotten it. So it'll be new <laughs> to most people, but it is stolen. And it is an academic transgression that I've committed. Um, but I wanted to steal from the book because no one shows better than Shaw what a cultural controversy is. 
controversy was one of Shaw's talents and he deserves to be known for. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to give you my own original uh, definition of controversy. Then I'll give you the English and the Irish backgrounds of the particular controversy I'm discussing. I will then tell you how it evolved, and then I will conclude. Um, so first, I'm going to define controversy, and it's a people's expressive genre. And when I say peoples, I'm using it in the same sense that Tony Blair used when he referred to the late Diana as the people's princess, I'm using it in that sense. It's a people's expressive genre whose belligerent exchanges and gestures are visible in newspapers and other printed materials and audible in public speeches, meetings, and conversations, and these days also present, of course, in social media. Cultural controversies, the kind Shaw was good at, emerge over institutions such as museums, theaters, languages, heritage sites, universities, and reputations of famous people, or artistic productions such as plays, books, paintings, sculptures, operas, and so forth. Insofar as controversies make headlines or offer tabloid thrills, they provide the same opportunity for vicarious involvement as any public drama, a trial, a scandal, an election. We have a lot of all of those these days. Um, however, a controversy is sparked, fueled, or provoked, whether it rages or explodes as a ruckus, commotion, cause celebre, tempest in a teapot, or much ado about nothing, it's generally very easy to join. The idle, the angry, or the passionate person sounding off is often said to be no stranger to controversy. Such debates would not exist as controversies if they didn't resonate in some way with a large public. In them, large forces explode in a small site. They don't usually cause transformations, but they make visible social change as it's in the process of occurring. They reveal with great clarity the tensions of a society at a particular moment. Their conflicts are often decided, if they're decided at all, by bluff and bravado, by performative skills and improvisational flair, which Shaw, of course, had a lot of. Um, the controversy I'm going to focus on has actually been mentioned twice today already, the showing up of Blanco Pavnet, and I was first alarmed to hear it mentioned and then relieved that it wasn't mentioned in much detail because I know far too much detail about this controversy and I can't even fit it into this and you should thank me for that. <laughs> um, it, it was, this was Shaw's 1909 play. Uh, this controversy didn't erupt. It was carefully, artfully, strategically staged. The controversy was the excuse for the play. It was it was primary, the play secondary. The controversy was the foreground, the play, the background. The Blanco controversy had different meanings in different countries. Um, and I'm going to first talk about England and then about Ireland. Written in England, this excruciatingly tedious play, it was great pain for me to read it a third time the other day. I can't stand it, but at any rate, but I love the controversy. This excruciatingly tedious play, was written for the sole purpose of exposing the inanity of the stage censorship law. Theatrical censorship, this is England I'm talking about now, had originated in 1737 um, when Sir Robert Walpole, irritated by characters of him, caricatures of himself in plays by John Gay and Henry Fielding, sent the Stage Licensing Act through Parliament. And this new measure required submission of plays to the Lord Chamberlain for licensing a fortnight before opening performances and granted the Lord Chamberlain the power to de deny licenses without giving any reason and to issue fines. And there was no procedure for appeal. If you were banned, you were banned, that was it. And this act established the office of the notorious examiner of plays. He, the Lord Chamberlain outsourced the actual reading of plays so he wouldn't have to do it to an examiner of plays. Um, in 1894, Shaw's play, Mrs. Warren's Profession, we just saw those sexy pictures of it, was denied a license. 
and thenceforth Shaw was active in fighting the censorship through letters to newspapers, in articles, and among members of the Society of Authors. In 1909, the whole issue was taken up by Parliament, a joint select committee of the House of Lords and the House of Commons on the stage plays censorship summoned witnesses and questioned them. And they actually summoned the examiner himself, a dim bureaucrat named George Alexander Redford. And when they asked Redford, on what principle do you censor plays, he said he had no principle. He said all he did was bring to bear an official point of view. I just love that. I see it all the time. And that, that tells you everything. So to engage with the issues at hand, Shaw wrote two new plays. Both refused licenses, that was the point. Uh, the first one was called Press Cuttings, in which a prime minister, Balls Quiff, engaged in cross-dressing. I mean, that was an easy one to censor. Um, Blanc Blanco's provocation was subtle. This play Shaw called a sermon, and it used what the censor considered blasphemy to express its religious vision. The play is set in an imaginary American West and dramatizes the conversion of a thief who gives away a stolen horse to help the mother of a dying child. I can just barely get to think about it, but I can't wait to finish telling you about it. I can't stand it. Anyway, there are two, just two naughty, provocative conversational exchanges. In one of them, Blanco says of God, he always has a trick up his sleeve. He's a sly one. He's a mean one. And then Blanco has a hypocritical evangelical brother who says, oh, is that the way to speak of the ruler of the universe, the great um, almighty God? Speak more respectful, Blanco, more reverent. So he sort of looked the censor into the play in the person of this tedious brother. Um, and then there's the local whore. Just in case that wasn't enough for the censor, Shaw put a whore in the play, and somebody says, I accuse the fair Euphemia of immoral relations with every man in this town. So Shaw could be pretty sure the play would be censored. Um, but the genius of the play lay in its inclusion of the minimum number of offensive phrases necessary to provoke the examiner in a story otherwise pious and unsubversive, which is probably why I don't like it. Um, when the parliamentary committee called Shaw as a witness, he made the case for what he called the conscientiously immoral play. Uh, but he was miffed when the committee didn't agree to include his 11,000 word statement on censorship into the record, but he made that the preface to Blanca. Okay, so that's England. Now we move to Ireland. In Ireland, theaters were not within the examiner's jurisdiction. They were under municipal control in every city except Dublin. And there, according to a 1786 law passed by the Irish Parliament, Theaters could be established only under royal letters patent. The examiner of plays in London derived his authority from Parliament, but the royal letters patent that just applied to Dublin theaters uh, grounded the Dublin theaters in the authority of the British monarch and hence of the viceroy, also called the Lord Lieutenant, um, in Dublin. So the Abbey Theatre's patent granted, granted by the king it forbade, it forbade a whole lot of things. Profanity, impropriety of language, indecency of dress, offensive personalities or representation of living persons, exhibition of wild beasts, misrepresentation of sacred characters, and anything calculated to produce riot or breach of the peace. Um, and its final clause vested power in the viceroy to declare the patent null and void. If the abbey managed to incorporate any of those things or do anything like that, the viceroy could say no more. Thus, the accidents of Irish theater history made it possible for the abbey to do what no other theater in Ireland could, represent its resistance to censorship as resistance to colonial authority. The Abbey Theatre's short history, and everybody here knows this, I'm sure, was rich in controversy. It had provoked the antagonism of the church with the 1899 play Kathleen, Countess Kathleen. It had angered Irish nationalists by the representation of female sexuality in Sing's Shadow of the Glen, 1903, and by more sexuality and an attractive patricidal young man in Playboy of the Western World, 1907. 
as Nikki Green writes, quote, the location of sex and violence in the sacred west of Ireland made the latter flag particularly offensive to nationalists. The Protestant background of the three Abbey directors, Lady Gregory Yates and Singh, who had actually just died in March of 18, uh, 1909, exacerbated the alleged insults. So Blanco offered just what the Abbey needed, an opportunity to defy the Viceroy and associate its opposition to Dublin Castle with popular nationalism. In England, Blanco derived its meaning from the opposition of playwright and government, Shaw against all of those men in Parliament. A performance there would, would have been a triumph for Shaw. In Ireland, the opposition was between the Irish theater and English authority. Its performance there would nationalize the theater. Shaw offered Blanco to the Abbey in the early summer of 1909, and they planned a first performance date of August 25th. Given advance notice of this production by a Belfast newspaper, the Under Secretary for Ireland, Sir James Doherty, summoned Lady Gregory to Dublin Castle and tried to prevent or delay production of the play. And of course, she had no intention of doing any such thing, and her memoir, Our Irish Theatre, records in detail many conversations with Sir James and then later with the Viceroy himself, Lord Aberdeen. And she answered their objections with Rebelly talk. She said things like, Are you going to cut off our heads? Uh, she misquoted Parnell and talked about, though I don't suppose Sir James Doherty noticed that, not setting bounds to the march of a nation. And when Lord Aberdeen was there and offered her a cup of tea, she refused it because she thought it might make her compromise her principles. And all of this, of course, with the thought of writing it down. I'm oddly reminded of Comey meeting Trump and writing everything down to put it in a book, which is just what Lady Gregory did. I couldn't get that out of my head. Anyway, it, when it became clear, it became clear that no clause of the patent was going to be violated. There was no indecency, no wild beasts. Um, and the only possible to reason to cancel the production would be a riot in the theater, should there be one. Uh, the Abbey directors, Gregory and Yates, made sure that every move in the campaign was reported in newspapers. The strategic interactions were great fun because Lord Aberdeen actually liked the Abbey Theater. Um, as he pointed out to Lady Gregory, he, he didn't use this simile, but I'm going to use it. Like Polonius, he had played once in the university. He'd even been one of Sir Henry Irving's pallbearers. That was meant to show up that he was so sympathetic to the Abbey. Um, he was only obliged to prevent the performance of Blanco, and this is a quote from Lord Aberdeen, because of the courtesies of officials to one another, and I, as the king's representative, cannot go against the king. The Abbey staged its great resistance to colonial authority less to defeat the pathetic viceroy than to be seen defeating him, and thereby to demonstrate the theater's right to the word national. All the nationalist organizations, including Sinn Féin, requested their members not to play the castle game, that's their phrase, by inciting a riot. The better to show up the viceroy, Shaw and Lady Gregory between them ensured that the audience would be composed in large part of a British colonial society in Ireland the same people who went to dances at Dublin Castle. They were the people who were going to see the play. And here, Shaw used with great skill the Fabian technique of permeation, by which one or two members of a powerful group are befriended and encouraged to influence their associates. Shaw enlisted the aid of his friends Gilbert Murray, Regius Professor of Greek at Oxford, and his wife, Lady Mary Murray, Gilbert Murray's supportive letter, which Shaw passed on to Lady Gregory, uh, read in part like this. So this is a letter that Shaw solicited from Gilbert Murray, Regis Professor of, is it, at Oxford. And this is what Gilbert Murray wrote. This is perfectly monstrous about the Dublin Castle officials, flagrantly unjust to you and insulting to the intelligence of those who have any serious interest in literature, capital L, and drama, capital L. I think, and my wife, whose tastes are severe, agrees with me that the condemnation of Blanco Posnet is one of the most utterly unintelligent things in Edward's record. Um, after the first successful performance of Blanco, 
Uh, this is what Shaw wrote back to Gilbert Murray. You have contributed very materially to the Dublin victory. The real point of issue was not the liberty of the stage or the merits of Blanco, but whether Lady Littleton, the wife of the Generalissimo, would come with her party. The fate of the castle hung on that. By Generalissimo, I have to explain this now, he means General Sir Neville L L Littleton, who was commander in chief of British forces in Ireland. I'll not go back to this. Whether Lady Littleton would come with her party. The fate of the castle hung on that. And Lady Ellet first said she could not possibly bring her young people to a wicked play or bring a blush to the cheek of the military. I'm sure she didn't say that, Sean. <laughs> An unscrupulous use of your letter and Lady Mary's verdict decided the struggle. I sent the letter to Lady Gregory. Lady Gregory planked it down confidentially on Lady Littleton's dressing table, and Lady L took her Bible and hymn book and brought her whole flock to the play with military honors. So her husband was the man who would be charged with putting down a rebellion, if there were one. I don't mean in the theater, I mean an actual one, head of all British forces. So the Murray Ménage offered the perfect team to bring the state over to the side of the artist because she was the Earl of Carlisle's daughter and an Earl of Carlisle had been Viceroy of Ireland in the mid-19th century and that was the original name of the O'Connell Bridge. Actually, there's a little plaque there that says that. Um, and he was a playwright and translator as well as an Oxford professor. So as a team, they, they were perfect here. Also making up the audience were the Irish intelligentsia, William Orpin, Frank Sheehy, Skeffington, Lily Yates, Jack Yates, and other relatives of the controversy's principles, but not apparently Shaw's aunt. Shaw's aunt was supposed to come, but she was too drunk, it was said, so the empty seat was given by Lily Yates to Lord Dunsany. In the event, there was no riot. Joseph Homway noted in his diary that, quote, all the audience at the conclusion wondered only why this censor vetoed it and put the bad name on it. According to Lady Gregory's account, there was a huge crowd outside the theater waiting to see what would happen. And this is now a quote from Lady Gregory's Our Irish Theater. When someone asked why the crowd was there, the answer was, they are defying the Lord Lieutenant. And when the crowd heard the audience's tremendous burst of cheering, they took it up and it went far out through the streets. The applause of the stylish audience was transformed into the seditious cheers of the crowd outside, where it was not the end of the play, but the Abbey's defiance that was being cheered. You can see Shaw's genius at controversy here by noting the ripple effect that moves from Shaw to Gilbert Murray to Lady Mary Murray back to Shaw, and then through Shaw to Lady Gregory, to Lady Littleton, to her whole flock who she brought to the play, to their cheers, and to the crowd outside who took up the cheering, and it went far out through the streets. Through the very material gestures of writing, sending, and forwarding a letter, and through the transferred auditory effect of the cheering, the final stages of the controversy's progress can be marked as Shaw's cultural authority, combined with Lady Gregory's social and cultural authority, is passed from person to person to person to person to the huge crowd. And yet it wouldn't be accurate to call this a great moment of social change, because stage censorship in England continued till 1968, and in Ireland, in independent Ireland, till 1997. In 1916, however, the Lord Lieutenant was again defied quite noticeably. So the Blanco controversy did, to some extent, reveal large forces in a small site. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucy. That sort of brings us back around to the hopelessness of theater as a site for activism, which Carry some interest in the expanded to us in terms of the awakening feminist movement. Uh, it is always interesting to see public institutions becoming sites for um, activism. That's one of the groups here so beautifully demonstrated. And thank you to, to all of our speakers here today for a really varied and complex look at Mr. Shaw. We have a little bit of time for questions before 
really great film. So, would anyone like to start with Joel Rowan? Yes. saving grace in all this is that it's, it's partly in the irony or in the dramatization of this slightly patronizing attitude. Like in the same way that in, for instance, Pygmalion, Henry Higgins is, in, can you, you can play him as a monster. He's trying to make this woman's life very different. I mean, he does stay in that um, difficulty in plucking a flower girl from the streets, teaching, teaching her to speak. And Henry Higgins is completely callous about what that will leave her as life. And finally, in his original ending to that play, he kind of, um, you know, she, she, she leaves him, she goes off. It's, it's different in the musical and in the movie, but, but actually, originally, she sort of goes off. And, and so I was talking about it as a kind of version of Far, also, because she leaves him and goes off and does her own thing in some way. Um, to connect it with her, I, I would say she's independent, but she's, she was also the, the, the daughter of a. Of a um, Kind of social activist and journalist, um, and she also takes on kind of controversial views, even including about pros um, prostitution and things, um, about eugenics. She and Yates and Shaw are actually linked also by a kind of eugenic attitude. Quite, I mean, when eugenics wasn't quite such a dirty word in 1910, 1911, she writes quite strongly about that. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I think I think yes, it, it is problematic what Shaw does, but he's at his best when he acknowledges. Shaw, I think the Shaw as patronizing toward women can be solved if we think of them as having an identification with women, with femininity. Like, I found a funny letter, I think, in your book, uh, where he wrote in drag, protesting the performance of a play as an outraged female for its representation of women. So if we think about, like, Shaw just really feeling like speaking as a woman, <laughs> now, you know, you can say what you want about his right to do that, but I sometimes think that's where he's coming from. And I think that's what's clear in Fanny's first play, when the joke is kind of that while they're fighting, the critics are fighting about Shaw, Fanny steps out, and in a way, Fanny is Shaw. <laughs> like, he writes this play partly because he cares about women and whether they can write plays, but also partly because in dramatizing his alter ego, it's Fanny. You know, <laughs> that's who he is. So, I don't know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of the superiority question, you have to remember that because the, yeah. the pose of GBS is superiority to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. To everybody who's ever lived. You know, yeah. it's, it's uh, you know, th this is a guy who will, you know, greet Pat Gandhi you know, as the second greatest person <laughs> in, in the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it, you know, he, yeah. he, so that, that's the public pose all the time. And so it's disentangling that from Shaw's actual relationships with women um, and, and, and his, his writing of such dynamic, female figures who come to dominate the stage. You know, so you, one thing you can, can take away, so if you if you look at a play like Heartbreak House, arguably his greatest play, you know, where you get this kind of timid little woman who, who at the beginning of the play who's kind of lost and nobody's paying attention to her and, and by the end of the play she's just she's a completely brazen, you know, powerful woman who's completely dominating everybody and everything going on around it. And, I mean I, you know so so I think that's that's what he does. I mean, I think you're absolutely right that he wants to be that woman, you know, yeah. he, he really, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that actually somehow yeah. boldness for him is female boldness. Yes. Um, and the men are always kind of caught up in useless in some way. Yes. It's very like O'Casey in that sense, of course, you know, where, where, you know, O'Casey ends up with, with just almost contempt for men, and, you know, yet heroism is always kind of female. Uh, so I, I think you're absolutely right. Okay, yes. Question might be for 
for Carrie, but possibly for the speakers generally, about um, maybe this shadowy figure of, of Ibsen. Uh, and I just thinking about it made me wonder about how one conducted similar discussion about Ibsen, our contemporary, and about whether Shaw is an international figure in quite the same way. Uh, does, he, does it translate to a wider European milieu, or are his obsessions and interests really those of Britain and Ireland in a certain kind of way? So I don't know if there's anything to work with there as a, as a thought, but. Uh, I think it could be when it's even First of all, I think first. People underemphasize the fact that Shaw is a comedian <laughs> and that Ibsen's plays aren't funny. So this comparison, and plus I'm working on Joyce's Exiles right now, and everyone compares that to Ibsen, but I think Exiles is funny. So an Irish writer can't take tragedy and write it, or even serious social issues, and write them not funny. So in some ways, the comparison surprises me. Just, you know, obviously Shaw drew, you know, he's to blame for it in some ways, because he's someone championing at Ibsen. But still, I think it's helpful to think of them sort of separately. But also, I think in terms of the cobwebs on Shaw, I, I actually just have to protest like ignorance. I mean, what cobwebs? Like, I love Shaw. I just reread Candida during the department meeting uh, the other week. <laughs> I was like, how many Shaw plays can I read? And I just like the sexiest play. I loved it. So, I mean, aside from the fact that Sabianism is no longer like a current term, you know, I don't, I don't get it. Like, he's a vegetarian. Like, what is not? What is cobwebby? It's, it's still funny. So, I don't know, that's kind of, that's kind of my thought. One of the interesting things about Shaw and, and Ibsen is that, that Shaw's great objection to Ibsen is, of course, that women commit suicide. And what, one of Shaw's rules is no woman is going to kill herself. Yeah. You know? And there isn't a Shaw play where a fallen woman commits suicide. No, she doesn't. She says, yeah, I'm a fallen woman so long. You know? I, I'm going to carry on with my life. Um, and, and, you know, so there's always an afterlife in Shaw, which there isn't Ibsen. So, you know, his, his critique of Ibsen is almost more important than and what he takes from which is which is huge, but particularly around feminism, you know. And of course, well, he took that from Wilde as well, of course. But yes. but but he, you know, it's it's a, it's an absolute rule which you know, oh, women are not going to shoot themselves. And actually, maybe I'll say one more thing for the first time is that now looking at the women's plays, it's quite interesting because I think what Shaw gives to the Irish theater to women like Kate O'Brien and Lady Gregory is like obviously this vision of female power on stage and the idea that women are powerful, that it's men who have to accommodate and deal with what the force that is woman. But then when you look at like the plays of Teresa Peavy from the 1930s, which have been on stage, well then you see that women playwrights, or at least Deepy, she's not emphasizing that women have power. She's emphasizing like the reasons why they have none, like they're really these agonized plays about the Catholic Church, their lack of employment opportunities, you know. So so in some ways reality tends to kind of look like what you think it does. So if you go to a shop play, you kind of come up thinking, yeah, you know, women are these powerful beings. And if you go to a DP play, it's a, a critique of all the patriarchal Catholic structure. But, you know, the Shaw plays have their a very strong role in the women's playwriting tradition as that kind of on the side of the power. So. Now, I need some guidance from the organizers. Uh, the, the running order says refreshments at this point. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, will we have time for one more question before we do that? We yes. do. So if there's one more question before we... Uh, I'm just curious to ask the assembled multitudes, how are people reading Shaw? You know, where do you see Shaw in your work? Not in your work, but in your dealings with younger scholars, with students. Um, I find I'm often directing students towards Shaw and that they direct themselves away. Um, <laughs> Shaw's low modern. He's not a, you know, he's not a high, and that's not in terms of quality, it's in terms of the, the style and the 
narrative and so forth. I mean, he's not high modern like how the other pound or Yates most of the time, um, but he's a low modern, and that's nothing wrong with that. Um, and I think, you know, if he's taught, if the right plays are taught, Pygmalion and not, you know what, and he's, if, you know, students will like him. So it's, you know, it's up to those who teach, I think, and those who run theaters to, to keep him going. It's not, it doesn't happen with, sort of magically without agency that a writer is either disappears from the radar or appears, you know. People have to do something. And I know that um, when I was looking into publishing the book, I was asking a couple of academics in Ireland, you know, was there a big interest or was there not? Because I felt there wasn't and in Ireland. And um, I was talking to one person, Eva Walsh, who was saying that he was frequently asked to contribute essays um, from American journals. Um, and he's not even really hugely interested necessarily in Shore. It's not a specialty, but he felt that in Ireland there was a falling away. and that he couldn't encourage students to, to, to look at all for PhDs. But I don't know if that's the experience of the rest of you. Uh, um, gosh. The, I, I would say, um, I, I mean, I've taught Shaw as MA uh, classes, particularly master's classes, uh, particularly John Law's Other Island is a wonderful play to put in a kind of Irish uh, literature course. And, and having written on some of Yeats's plays, which are never put on or seen by anybody, really, <laughs> I think Shaw does pretty well. Um, <laughs> Yeats has a kind of afterlife because of a kind of survival of a particular kind of drama through, probably through Beckett, who, who really looks to Yeats and O'Casey and Singh and deliberately doesn't look at the unacceptable apple cart of Shaw as a kind of model, although one could contest that, I think. I mean, I, th I think Shaw is, is remarkably present a lot. I mean, for instance, I have to disagree violently with Lucy about the play The Showing Up of Blanco Poznan, which I had to read, I think, for the second time recently, just the other week. And it, it's a it's a wonderful it, it's odd play and, it, and certainly if you think it's going to be the most controversial play you've ever seen it's going to come down it's going to seem a bit dull but it's a trial it's a it's a show trial and in theory it's a show trial of Blanco Poznan this kind of horse rustling you know minor petty thief but actually it's a trial of God and you know the, the power of religion really um, you know the uh, the and it's also a trial of kind of playwrights anyone who puts a kind of wonderful coincidence in a play or a novel is tried by this play. It's actually about how awful coincidences happen sometimes, and therefore um, God is really cruel, in fact, evil. Um, and again, there's a very strong and powerful woman who, who affects everything in that play, uh, it, just by her, her presence, really, this, this mother of a child who dies, because even though finding Blanco's horse that he's stolen, his horse rustled, she still doesn't get in time to save her child who's dying. It's an awful kind of thing to happen, but actually, I, I mean, I, I do think there's there's some energy in that uh, kind of play, and in a lot of his plays, it's that it, yeah, it, it is Mano John, but kind of knowing Mano John, and, yeah. and borrows, in fact, yeah. directly from Singh's Playboy, as Andy Roach says, it's, it's a really, it's a really vibrant play, so, so, Lucy, I don't, we'll have to disagree about that, but, yeah. but I mean, okay. it, 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 it's, it's dull in certain terms, and maybe it's unstageable, perhaps, but it's, it's very, very interesting, and I like so many of these, I, I turn back to it. Do you want to have a round about that with a glass of wine? Because it's, it's going to be waiting outside. Um, I said at the beginning that Shaw could be useful to us in all kinds of ways today. But we've discovered a new use for him now from Kerry, which is to read his plays during the day. I hope we all take that away. Thank you to all of our speakers. So before we thank that, I just wanted to one short director, which is that we, it's a quick glass of wine, and and then we'll reassemble and connect up.